20 people shot, several at point-blank range. Many of the survivors are being treated behind me here at the University Medical Center. And now authorities want to know what caused the alleged gunman, Jared Lee Loughner, to snap. This is the story of a once quiet and talented young man who went on to do something that became nationwide news. His horrific actions will be considered for years to come as the darkest episode in the history of Tucson, Arizona. Welcome to Fear Files, where we discuss and dissect the most mysterious, terrifying, and mind-bending cases from all over the world. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you're a fan of our work. Also, hit that bell icon so you can be notified each time we post a chilling story. Before we start, we would like to say that our thoughts and prayers go towards all the families that fell victim to the deranged actions of one particular man. Welcome to Tucson, Arizona, a beautiful city set in an arid landscape right in the southwestern corner of the United States. Known to be one of the oldest cities in the country, Tucson, Arizona is located just 60 miles from the Mexico border. The culture is highly influenced by the Mexican population. According to the residents, the abundance of delicious Mexican food paired with Latino music makes the town truly special. When non-residents hear about this city, they think it's just a place in the middle of the desert. But little do they know that Tucson is the home of fabulous weather and beautiful mountains. Despite its growth in recent years, the city is still renowned as a friendly, welcoming place. The city has nearly 800,000 residents, yet it still maintains its small-town feel. If you'd ask most of the people to describe the place, they would say it's safe. At 10 a.m. on the 8th of January 2011, Gabrielle Giffords, a recently re-elected senator, was about to begin a session of Congress on your corner. This program made it possible for politicians to meet up with their supporters and have face-to-face -face conversations about different problems or plans. According to a Tucson resident, Gabby liked to make herself available to the town's people. She hated the idea of meeting in a formal setting. She believed in accessibility and keeping a strong connection with the needs of the members of the community. Many people were looking forward to a meeting with their senator and have a meaningful discussion. A crowd gathered on a beautiful blue-skied Saturday morning. Spirits were high, but unknown to those present, a danger lurked amongst them. In a fraction of a second, the lives of those waiting in line would be suddenly torn apart. At exactly 10.10 a.m., the peaceful town of Tucson, Arizona was rocked by the actions of one young man, 22-year-old Jared Lee Loughner. In a killing spree that lasted only 17 seconds, the young man managed to end the lives of six people and wounded 13 more, the congresswoman being one of his victims, and apparently, she was his main target. But what could have determined Loeffner to take such drastic actions and ruin the lives of so many people? Were his motives just, or did he suffer from a mental illness? Let's find out who exactly is Jared. Born on the 10th of September 1988, Jared Lee Loeffner was raised as an only child in a working-class area of the city. His mother was a respected and well-liked manager for the Parks and Recreation Department of Prima County, while his father was in the business of restoring cars. During his early years, Loeffner enjoyed a close-knit circle of friends. Layla Chavez, a former friend of the killer, said that the two met through mutual friends. They were about 12 or 13 at the time, and a common bond they had was music. They became close when Layla Chavez just learned to play the guitar and an idea popped into her mind. She wanted to start a band. The word spread, and Jared, who played bass during that time, linked up with her for an occasional jam session. Another former friend of Jared, Tyler Zwern, revealed another side of him. He remembered that in their teenage years, they would get into all sorts of trouble. This would include drinking, wreaking havoc on the neighborhood, smashing mailboxes, and everything a rebellious teen would do. But despite some episodes of delinquency, he wasn't considered dangerous amongst his peers. But as Jared Loeffner reached his late teens, the friendly relaxed musician that everyone liked began to change for the worse. It seems that a big turning point in his life was when he had a crush on a classmate in high school. According to her, after a swift romance the two broke up, and Jared was crushed. He supposedly felt betrayed and started to isolate himself, 
he withdrew from school and he stopped talking to his friends. As an increasingly isolated teenager, Loeffner eventually dropped out of high school in 2006. His slow retreat into a private world went relatively unnoticed, but five years later he would grab the nation's attention with a vengeance. On the 8th of January 2011, at 12.29am, Jared checked into room 411 at the Motel 6 in Tucson. Ten hours would pass until the horrendous killing spree would happen. As the night progressed, Loftner made several short trips to a local convenience store. At 1 a.m., he picked up a roll of newly developed film containing photos he'd taken of himself only hours earlier. There were several pictures of him wearing female underwear. Besides those, a picture of a 9mm gun was also found, stacked on top of a U.S. textbook. Loftner made the final return to his room at 4.12 a.m. with his newly developed photographs. He then logged onto his computer and entered into his familiar subversive world within the internet before he posted the bizarre images online. Then he spent the rest of the night sending out emails to his online friends, sharing his views and telling them goodbye. In recent months, Loftner had been pushing away friends and family in the real world in favor of an online community. A lot of his MySpace records showed that he was into revolutionary literature, such as Mein Kampf. One particular site, which he would visit, was a gathering place for conspiracy theorists and skeptics. There, Loeffner hoped that his bizarre views would be understood. He would often post long rambling comments, often about currency, about the constitution of America, how high schools were an illegal act, and how gold and silver were the only true currency to believe in. His opinions started to become so ridiculous that some of his online friends even suggested that he'd seek psychological help. While he was at Pima Community College, there were a couple of instances when issues that are difficult to talk about, like abortion or war, would come up. When these topics would arrive, Loeffner would burst out laughing and even made rude jokes on the subject. When he was confronted by teachers or even peers, Loeffner would still keep his smug attitude, telling everyone that they're idiots and they don't understand anything that's going on. Everyone around him noticed how much he changed and how he continued to do so as the days went on. One of the staff working at the community college said that one day, while she walked past Jared's class, she heard his rambling about something. The woman found the tone of his voice terrifying, and that evening she emailed one of her co-workers saying that she had a strong gut feeling about Loftner. She truly believed that one day, he'll come into class with a gun, and terrible things would happen. Well, it turned out she wasn't far from the truth. The final straw for college authorities came when Loftner posted a disturbing video online. Jared took a handheld camera and walked around the campus of Pima Community College, basically talking about it being the biggest waste of money in American education, amongst other things. After that incident, the authorities at Pima College had a meeting with Loftner and his parents and threatened he'd be kicked out of college if something doesn't change. He was suspended from taking classes, and he couldn't come back until he went to a psychiatrist and returned with a mental health evaluation to prove that nothing is wrong with him. Of course, he was not able to produce the documentation. How's it going? Thanks for the B. I'm, I'm pissed off. What's that? We are looking at students who have been tortured. This is Pima Community College. One of the biggest scams in America. The students are so illiterate that it affects their daily lives. It is so illegal to sell this book under the Constitution. We are also censored by our freedom of speech. They're controlling the grammar. All the teachers that you have are being paid illegally and have a legal authority over the Constitution of the United States under the First Amendment. This is genocide in America. At 7.04 a.m. on the 8th of January 2011, just three hours before Loeffner embarked on his killing spree, he left his motel room and made yet another trip to his store. This time he tried to buy ammunition for a recently purchased handgun. He had attempted to purchase 9mm ammunition, however his behavior was so erratic that the sales clerk thought twice about giving him what he wanted. He actually told Jared that he was out of ammunition for that particular gun. At 7.31am, undeterred, Loeffner attempted to purchase ammunition from a different store. This time, failing to raise any suspicion, he succeeded in buying 8 boxes containing a total of 400 rounds. With only 4 hours to go before the arrival of his main target, Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords, Jared was on the move once again. This time, he was making his way home. 
As Lofner approached the front door of his house, he was confronted by his father. The man asked his son what did he carry in his bag. Not wanting to reveal that he had 400 rounds of ammo, Jared ignored the question. Of course, the two then got into a verbal argument. In recent months, the relationship between him and his parents had become increasingly strained. His parents had actually taken the keys to his car as an attempt to punish him for the way he was acting. Both Randy and Amy Lofner were clearly concerned about their son's behavior. They tried to talk to him, but they just couldn't make any headway. Unfortunately, they had no idea what he was about to embark on, but they knew that their son was battling something, and he was certainly confused to say the very least. In the front yard, the standoff between father and son continued. Jared, not being able to take his car, grabbed a black bag from the trunk and walked away, leaving his dad wondering what he was up to. Then, needing a means of transportation, Jared called a cab. In just a matter of minutes, Lofner would embark on a killing spree that would shock the nation to its core. At around 10 a.m. on the 8th of January 2011, one of America's oldest cities was devastated by a brutal killing spree, carried out by a disturbed 22-year-old man. Just one hour earlier, everything seemed peaceful in Tucson, Arizona, but it was the calm before the storm. It was a beautiful Saturday morning. Early January is the time of the year that people who live in southern Arizona cherish. The reason being that it's usually 70 degrees during that time. The sun is up, and it's ultimately a wonderful period to be outside. For the residents, their lives were about to become unintentionally entwined with the arrival of Senator Gabrielle Giffords. What was supposed to be happening at the Safeway that day was what's called a Congress on Your Corner, and it's a program that Congresswoman Giffords had installed, in which she would meet on occasion with her constituents. There were telephone calls made out to her supporters the previous day, informing them of the event, and it was just an opportunity for her to interact with the people of Tucson. By doing so, she would get a feel of some of the items or some of the political issues they had on their mind. Unbeknownst to Gabrielle Giffords and her team, what was supposed to be a very low-key relaxed gathering had in fact a very real and present threat attached. Jared Lee Lofner had a burning hatred for the congresswoman that could be traced back to an incident that happened years ago. He had actually met Gabrielle Giffords at a rally similar to the one scheduled on the 8th of January. At a previous meet and greet, while waiting in line, he asked the congresswoman a question. Jared asked her, What is the government if words don't have a meaning? This question was without any context, and at the time, congresswoman Giffords obviously didn't know what answer to give him. One of her associates thanked Jared for the question and moved on to the next one. He took that slight very personally, and from that moment on, hatred that grew inside of him over the months and years that followed. But it didn't stop there. Another form of contact between the two made Jared hate her even more. He also wrote a letter to her office after that. Her representatives wrote back to him, but they made the mistake of addressing the letter to a Mr. Lofney rather than Lofner. This honest mistake angered him even more, and in his mind it proved that he was intellectually superior to the people that were in power. So, he had no respect for politicians, teachers, or authority. But the things he would not do couldn't have been motivated by these beliefs. There are millions of people who think a politician is not fit to run a country. This kind of killing spree is clearly not political. It comes out of psychopathology. It's safe to say that Jared Lochner would have opened fire under these circumstances, even if he had never met Congresswoman Giffords. At 9.54 a.m., Lochner arrived by taxi outside the Safeway store. Lots of small behavioral clues that were taken into consideration even before the spree that would commence, indicated that the man was completely lucid and coherent. He took a taxi to the supermarket where Giffords was speaking. He had the money on him to pay. He gave a bill to the taxi driver and insisted on the change. So he clearly knew what he was doing and where he was. No one could argue that Lofner was in a precarious mental state when tragedy struck. Just a few yards away from where the cab dropped him off, his intended target was about to greet those who had been queuing to meet her. No one had any clue about what was going to happen. One of the witnesses said that there were about 25 people in line, waiting for a chance to talk with Gabrielle. Amongst them, elderly women, kids, and even couples were present for the event. All innocent people, who took the opportunity to maybe make a positive change in their community by telling the congresswoman what problems she might have missed. The congresswoman was accompanied by one of her aides, Gabe Zimmerman, who carefully instructed the crowd to create a straight line and wait their turn. Everything seemed fine and well-organized. Another witness told the police that she wasn't a fan of politics, even though she was in the area. She and her husband were there to go to the grocery store, and as they walked in, she saw a man walk past her in the opposite direction, and he had a strange look on his face. Little did the woman know 
that he was the killer who would end so many lives on that day. At 10.10 a.m., Loeffner's killing spree began. All of a sudden, while the congresswoman was addressing the people, Loeffner came charging through the crowd, took out his gun, and opened fire. He managed to shoot Gabrielle Giffords directly in the head. Gabe Zimmerman, who witnessed the incident from up close, quickly ran towards the congresswoman. He kneeled down next to her and tried to see if she was still alive. But in that moment, Gabe Zimmerman was also caught in the line of fire, and he immediately lost his life. People who weren't attending the meeting were startled by the sound of a gun going off. Some of them even said that they didn't know what was going on, because they never heard a gunshot before. According to one of the residents who was there for shopping, she saw a bunch of people running into the store. They were screaming, saying that the congresswoman had been shot. That's when panic ensued amongst all of them. One of the women who was close to the congresswoman at the time of the incident said that in all of that confusion, she just saw a figure walking amongst the people. He looked like a shadow. Jared then turned to his left of the queuing line of shocked attendants, and he rapidly opened fire again. One of the men there said that he dropped to the ground at the exact moment when a bullet was fired. It managed to graze the back of his head without seriously injuring him. As the frenzied attack continued, Loeffner turned his gun on the then district director Ron Barber. Another attendee, Judge John Roll, leapt in between the two in a moment of sheer bravery. John Roll pushed Ron Barber away, but in that moment, a bullet hit him, ending his life on the spot. A man jumped in to try and save his life. He started doing CPR on John Roll, but unfortunately it was too late. The judge lost his life in an attempt to save another. In the seconds that followed, a bystander seized the opportunity and picked up the nearest chair, hitting Loeffner across the back. After being hit, the killer's left arm flew out, losing his balance. That gave another man a chance to grab Loeffner's wrist and try to immobilize him. The next thing the man did was to block Jared from running away and started hitting him as hard as he could, while still holding his left hand. During the struggle that followed, Loeffner fell to the ground. People were screaming, Get the gun! Loeffner tried to grab a fully loaded magazine so that he could make use of his gun. In that tussle, another person took the magazine away from him, along with the gun, leaving the killer unarmed. The man who grabbed his gun pointed it at Jared, threatening him. With the criminals being subdued by the people who were there just to attend the meeting, spirits calmed down a bit, and someone called the police. Loeffner was soon in police custody, and news of his identity began to filter out. Just advising Safeway, Ina and Oracle County is going to be working a shooting. Um, we've got multiple, multiple, multiple calls. They have not called us for assistance. I'm assuming they're quite 10 6 at this point. Uh, we've been informed Gabriel Giffords is involved. But what drove this lifelong resident of Tucson to commit such a devastating rampage? A ruthless spree that shook his local community to the core. The massacre only lasted 17 seconds, but Loeffner emptied a 33-round magazine of its bullets into an unsuspecting crowd. The ruthless attack would ultimately leave six people dead and 13 wounded. Five minutes after the last bullet was fired, police arrived on the scene where Loeffner was immediately placed in handcuffs and removed from the devastating aftermath of his killing spree. The first thing he said to law enforcement was that he wants them to know that no one else besides him was involved in what happened. He wanted everyone to know that this was him and him alone. Maybe he wanted the notoriety just for himself. With the killer safely in custody, people began to take stock of themselves and those around them. Everyone came together and they started helping each other. Between the casualties, a nine-year-old child was found lifeless on the ground. One of the witnesses said that the memory of seeing CPR performed on this small child without her being able to recover will forever stay burned in her mind. Tragically, on the way to the hospital, she passed away. Amongst those critically wounded was Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords with a serious gunshot wound to the head. Fortunately, the politician managed to survive the gunshot. According to her doctors, the Congresswoman was shot just above her left eye, and while the exact path of the bullet was unknown, they said the bullet never crossed from one hemisphere of the brain to the other. In the days and weeks following the shooting, she began immediately responding to commands and soon graduated to scrolling through her iPad and going outdoors. At the Institute for Rehabilitation and Research in Houston, Giffords met daily with a team of specialists, including speech, occupational, and physical therapists, as well as a neuropsychologist who helped rehabilitate her cognitive functioning. Within two months, Giffords was mouthing the words to Twinkle Twinkle Little Star and Happy Birthday 
and talking on the phone. She also walked up and down halls using a shopping cart and did squats, slowly managing to gain her balance and strength back. In early June, over five months after the shooting, the first photos of Giffords were released. Taken May 17th, the photos show Giffords with her mother and feature that same bright smile she had before the shooting. Just seven months after the shooting, Gabrielle Giffords made a triumphant return to the House of Representatives to cast a vote on the debt ceiling deal in Congress. Giffords, who voted yes to the deal, was greeted with a standing ovation, and everyone was happy that she was finally back. But she resigned from office in 2012 to focus on her recovery and has since become a prominent gun control advocate. On the 9th of March 2011, at the Arizona Superior Court, Jared Lee Loeffner was initially charged on 49 counts. If he was found guilty, he would face the death sentence. At his first court hearing in May 2011, he had an outburst. He seemed as if he was disconnected from what went on. He was acting erratically and even violent. Upon observing his reactions, people recognized that he was a very confused person and that he was spiraling into madness without a doubt. His behavior during his court hearing resulted in him being forcibly removed from the court. He was deemed unfit to stand trial and remained in custody, but as time went on, his mental health declined even further. Loeffner became psychotic, to the point where he started having hallucinations, and one time he even paced for 50 straight hours in his cell. The man started suffering from open sores on his feet that got infected. On the 26th of June 2011, Loeffner was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia, and the trial judge ruled that Jared shall be forcibly medicated with antipsychotics. Taking into consideration his mental illness, it is a possibility that he truly believed that he was killing evil people. After 14 months on medication, he was deemed competent to stand trial, where the prosecution was seeking the death penalty. His representation saw what was coming, and they convinced him to plead guilty for his actions. That way, Jared would escape execution. He admitted guilt to 19 of the 49 original charges, including attempted assassination of a congresswoman, the murder of two federal employees, causing the death of four others, attempted murder of two federal employees, and injuring 10 others through the use of a pistol. Jared Lee Loeffner was given seven consecutive life terms plus 140 years. This meant that under current law, he will never be released from prison. Since the shooting spree, mental health and gun control laws have again become the focus of fierce debate throughout America. This was the case of Jared Lee Loeffner, a once talented musician and rebellious teen who overnight turned into a cold-blooded killer. We would love to hear your take on the case, so feel free to comment down below. If you found this story compelling, don't forget to like the video, share it with your friends, and subscribe to the channel. Also, hit that notification bell in order to stay up to date each time we reveal a new shocking case. And until next time, stay safe and keep your eyes peeled. You never know what's lurking in the shadows.